Hey Gemini, welcome to Catalyst Energies and welcome to your weekly astrology forecast. My name is Dee, thanks for joining me and we are, um, you know, mostly going to talk about the weekend because the astrology of the weekend is just immense and of course we're going to look at the week of the last lunar quarter leading up to the first new moon of 2022 which is going to be on the 2nd of January, a new moon in Capricorn. But it's the weekend. The weekend is so substantial. So let's get right into it because there's so much information. Gemini. All right, let's um, let's get right into it. So the 24th is uh, is got some very uh, challenging aspects to work through or not even to do anything about. I mean, they're going to confine us in such a way that if we are not malleable or certainly um, willing to be flexible and adaptable, um, and shape shift in some ways. And Gemini, this is, you know, you have mutable energy on your horizontal axis here of consciousness. So mutability and even mutability on your four, you know, the four corners, basically. So this is not something that you're unfamiliar with as a Gemini is the mutability. So um, being able to lean into these squares, we're going to have a square with Saturn and Uranus that is exact on the 24th. So this has been leading up and is going to reverberate still for a couple more days. But um, we also have this opposition uh, at the same time with the moon at 30 degrees Leo opposite Jupiter before it moves into Pisces. And so that's going to happen this week too, leading up to the new moon is Jupiter is going to come into Pisces and it's like, ah, right? A sigh of relief. Um, and for you specifically, Gemini, it's coming into the realm of your career house and your mission, your contribution to society. Like what is it that you are part of building at a social um, and institutional level. And this is often considered career. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to translate literally to that, but it's the idea of what you're here to do, right? What is your contribution? And when Jupiter comes into the 10th house, I mean, this is going to be pretty strong for Gemini to start really stepping into a position of leadership and management in terms of contribution and um, maybe teaching, maybe, um, you know, just expanding on your uh, understanding. And especially in Pisces, Jupiter and Pisces, this is the Hierophant. Um, this transition has come up very strongly in uh, the intuitive portion of my transmission today, the daily medicine transmission, and it is coming out strong in everybody's reading, like the area that that aspect is going to start really um, become very large and expand in. And for Gemini, it's in your career house, your contribution. So stepping into a teaching position, into some sort of management of social or political or institutional power um, and confidence and uh, a real search for truth and a an advocate for that as well, right? Jupiter is very much an advocate and a representative. This also could mean um, a real expansion of resources into your career or into your mission as well. So the opposition to the moon, Gemini, right before making this transition and um, before the moon has moved into Virgo is um, a real, you know, deep feels, especially for Gemini. I mean, we're looking at your, you know, the cusp of your third and fourth houses right down here in your nadir area and, and the moon. So deep feels, right? Very deep sensitivity to something that cannot be contained anymore. And when we're talking about the third house or generally here, for Gemini, I mean, this is the house of um, learning and language and the way that your mind really works. And to have Leo here, I mean, it needs to shine the brightest. Gemini, um, in the realm of the everyday activity of speaking and communicating and writing and reading and researching and empirical reasoning and logic and evidence detection, all of these third house um, types of processes, tech a technical skill, practicing a technical skill. Um, all of these things it, are represented by Leo for the Gemini. You know, the the mind has to be like a sun. And that, that makes a lot of sense considering that, um, you know, you're definitely a Mercury ruled person and it's very close. And, you know, it's the planet closest to the sun. 
it just needs to shine bright. You're, you're, you have to be kind of the center in, in the mental, um, and cognitive realm. And this is where you do shine the brightest as a Gemini person, I feel like is in this realm. So something deeply, um, I would say personal and authentic and creative really cannot be capped anymore for Gemini. And this, this moon is, um, a, a deep sensitivity to it, right? Deep feels about it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll express it, but you are feeling it and you can feel the Kundalini of risen and ready to be released, um, in the area of your own personal power, Gemini. It's that, you know, Jupiter, which does rule your seventh house as well as the 10th house it's about to go into. Like I said, the ninth house is a great territory for Jupiter in general. And its transit of Aquarius for Gemini may not have been nearly as uh, difficult as it's been for other people, right? Jupiter and Gemini is, is kind of counterintuitive to Jupiter because it wants to expand and it has no boundaries and it's understanding and big picture. It's limitless, larger than life, right? Because it's Zeus, Aquarius is the thunderbolt. And so we've been consistently shocked back into, uh, into line, into alignment with our value system with Jupiter. As long as we are on the trajectory of, of acting in accordance to the, the, the right collective belief system, we are being, um, supported and advocated for by Jupiter. That's what it represents. It's a representative, um, a good fortune expansion. So, but in the ninth house, it's, it's probably been a bit easier of a transit than most people have had with Jupiter in Aquarius because it's laser focus, right? That's hard when, when your real superpower is the expansion of understanding and meaning, right? Which is why it makes a great wisdom teacher. Okay. So, but in the ninth house, at the very least, Gemini, um, the fact that your belief system is, um, ultimately characterized by the ability to tap into the Aquarian, uh, nature. I, I feel like, you had, um, an easier time than other people. So even at this stage where it is in opposition to the moon in Leo here, um, you're releasing, um, so much power through this conscious totality of, of being, um, that is, it's almost like, despite the fact that it's an opposition, it's very easy to find the balance point here for Gemini. And I don't even understand why it's like when you can release, the larger meaning and context, um, with Jupiter as like, a you know, as a overarching wisdom or an understanding, it kind of allows you personally, um, and individually and emotionally to deepen your sensitivity and deepen your, um, connection to that aspect that wants to be released. It's almost like it allows it to be released a lot easier than other people are experiencing in this particular opposition. Now, the square, the grand square that is surrounding all of this, which is phenomenal, is a structure that we don't get out of, right? A grand square is a forced confrontation. It is something that we cannot escape from and we must deal with. And in the, in the birth chart, that is the case. And in galactic astrology for star seeds, it very much is the case, but in a way that's like, you can't get off your mission because it's keeping you absolutely, um, you know, fortressed in your power. It comes from uh, staying on task with this. And so it's very similar that this is the square here that is partially this opposition and the other opposition between the nodal axis of the moon. So it's very karmic. Um, and very related to you, Gemini, in terms of what you, where you have been in terms of your own identity when it comes to the direction the entire collective has been led to in order to evolve. So, which is, again, being able to simultaneously and seamlessly um, identify with both angel and demon on your shoulder because they are one in the same and separation in this material world for whatever reason, um, if it was intentional or we were um, manipulated into being here, we still have to learn to deal with it. And Gemini people are, um, it's, it's woven into the fabric of who they are. So they are like, are, they are the teachers, right? In some ways. 
than they have been. So there's no getting around this square. Um, and it has a lot to do with your power and it has a lot to do, it has a lot to do with your actual four corners here of your axis of consciousness and your axis of power. Um, and who you, who you know yourself to be, um, and who you know yourself to be in your relationships, and then how you feel about where um, you are gathering your power and what wants to come out. What definitely went, because there is, um, Leo is combust and it releases very powerfully. There is, uh, there is no duality here. Um, it's just a very singular, um, very bright, very intense experience of being uh, that is uh, represented by Leo. So it's an interesting dynamic. Now, on top of that, another square that's happening on the 20, 24th on Christmas Eve is Saturn also in your ninth house. That's also making your process of mystical exploration very uh, methodical and um, fact checking along the way and making sure that it's uh, very everything that you are coming to understand as a result of your process is um, under scrutiny and is and it's checked and it you know is is passes the test before you move on to then expand on that so it also can keep you from exploring and expanding in um, to new territory because um, it's very uh, it's very dense and there's a sense of um, like I said st the stabilization and uh, almost to the point where you like I said it may be hard to allow for expansion into new realms because it's very fixed and it's very uh, stabilized and. Um, it's like a piece of rebar, right? Or roots, but not even roots. It's like the oak tree. Like it's, it, it's been there for so long that it's, um, stabilizing, uh, this realm of understanding and meaning for the Gemini, right? Which is again in Aquarius, um, um, an air sign. Now the square to Uranus has been building for days as well and is exact on the 24th and is going to also reverberate for a couple more days because these two Titans move slowly and they are in relationship to each other a little bit longer than say other planets that move more rapidly in their orbit. So it's been building and you can definitely feel it. Um, and these two are not ever getting along. And so when they're in a square, they're really going to cause some potential damage. So Uranus is in Taurus in your 12th house, Gemini. So I think that everybody has been experiencing this lack of stability, um, in their material realm, their resources, uh, their own bodies in some ways. And so, for Gemini, this is really making itself more, most known, like in your, in the astral, right? The astral, the spiritual, the, uh, dream state, um, the realm of, um, mystical experience, right? This is the end and the return to God or return to great spirit or source. And certainly, uh, an isolation that, uh, forces one to return to themselves, and to surrender back into the flow of the current of the universe. So to have Uranus here, Gemini, there's been very little stability um, in a realm that's hard to even have any. But for the Gemini, the nature of the spiritual realm is very is very material, right? It's and in in and fertile, right? It's a very fertile, and the that's it's a medium for growth, and the medium for growth for for Gemini is the um, the spirit. And so there has been a lot of variability. And I think that what we're all doing is scrolling through all of these potentials of what we could have, um, what we could own, what we could uh, call our own in some ways. And maybe this is, um, you know, we're not talking about religion here in the 12th house. We're literally talking about the realm of the Akash and the quantum experience. And so Gemini, I think specifically is, um, really shopping around in some ways, um, because there is no stability in terms of, um, 
how how to best surrender to this fertile ground and how best to surrender to this process in general. And I don't think that that's necessarily a difficult thing, although um, it depends on where other things are in your chart that may enhance this or challenge it. What's what is going to be <laughs> what is going to be challenging here is for everybody is that people need to lighten up number one because if you don't allow yourself the space to be innovative to be free to be even revolutionary in all of this uranian way right to um to allow for the sudden changes or radical reorientation if you don't allow space for that or at least um, be aware of that then there is potential damage that can happen with this square because Saturn's not going anywhere Saturn represents like the you know the black cube it represents the um, the atom itself right there is no and and, and f the law of nature right and the and the universal forces right you can even think about gravity and time and space actually being ruled by Saturn as well because all those things are intertwined in the material use universe in terms of classical physics. So if it's not going anywhere and it's, it's staunchly placed in your uh, house of belief systems and understanding and, me and meaning and like I said, it will... Um, require that every aspect is accounted for in terms of the mystical journey, for instance, or any kind of journey, right? Like long-term travel, um, perhaps any kind of uh, graduate work. Um, it, it's, it represents an authority, but it also represents stability um, and a sense of responsibility and also um, finishing what you started, right? Um, fulfilling your uh, obligations is a big part of Saturn as well. There's no doing things half-assed when it comes to that. So in your belief systems, it's very very staunchly and very, uh, it's very sturdy there. But the thing is, is that you are, look, and that's, those are, those are, beliefs based on human interaction and relationship, right? The meaning is the catalyzing, uh, the meaning is the catalyzing force that allows you to turn lead into gold. Um, the square is that your higher self and your, the third eye and the higher mind in some ways really wants to individuate in the direct experience of being, um, uh, surrendered to the flow. If that makes sense, these are very different things, although they represent the same areas in a, a lot of times, which could be like spirituality and metaphysics, but one is understanding and higher mind. And the other is completely submerged in the experience. And so if you don't allow for a little bit of, um, uh, if you don't allow for some space in your belief systems and the, your, the way that you derive meaning and, and, and the big picture of alchemy, uh, and transmutation, right? This is, again, these are the, the, the broader cultural horizons that we develop as a result of traveling and, and higher education. If we do not allow for some flexibility and adaptability in this square, I mean, this is, Uranus will have its way regardless of what you have to say about it. And, and, you, and Saturn just won't budge. And so there will be other ways for this crisis to find its expression. And for Gemini, I mean, to have that type of psychological crisis in your 12th house could be really, um, uh, could be very destabilizing, um, and could have you potentially, um, oh boy, I, wow. I didn't really think about this until now. And I really hope this isn't the case for anybody who's listening to this, but one of the, the most extreme thing that I thought of is like a hospitalization, right? Because, um, because there needs to be um, some measure of vari variability in this realm of the mystic um, in order to be able to, you know, um, be able to shop for a specific um, experience or be able to, uh, you know, seamlessly uh, move among different experiences in this realm. But if your belief systems are so firmly planted um, that they are 
you can't get away from that. I could see a, a break, a psychotic break or a hospitalization that forces you into isolation. So you have to start um, waking up in some ways. But there are so many less extreme versions of this that could be expressed Um but I thought that was a good way to explain it so that it was really clear, but it doesn't have to be exactly like that. Um, I really hope it isn't. Um, but this time of year is a very difficult time for people. There's so much pressure um, that people who are um, really struggling already with mental health or emotional health um, or even just like having a crisis of faith could very much... Um, uh, yeah, it can be impacted by this time of year. So this is the 24th. The 25th has Venus and Pluto coming into the second conjunction. And at the same time, Mars is in a trine to a now direct Chiron. So now we have another instance right after this where Venus is offering up another layer of density that has... Um, you know, when, when Venus had met with Pluto the first time, I think it was really strong. And for you, Gemini, it's in the realm of the shadow and it's in the realm of what you're producing and, uh, with, uh, in your relationships and, and betrayal and intimacy and investments and profit. These are all part of the eighth house because it, they require a commitment or a binding contract. And then this is what's produced as a result of that. And that, falls into a lot of different types of relationships. But for Gemini, something, something, um, something of meaning and value met with Pluto when it comes to sharing and cooperation and when it comes to communion with others that was ready to be released um, and offered up to Pluto. And it may have been very disrupting or um, it may have been very painful and has forced us into a very deep inventory. So now that Venus is uh, retrograde and coming back to the same point with Pluto, there will be more to offer, but even more introspective, deeper inventory, and um, even, I think, even more graceful willingness to um, offer up to Pluto some more of that, but in a much more conscious and um, aware way of what we are releasing and, and why. Um, and Gemini, like I said, it's in the realm of the shadow and, and sharing, right? Sharing and communion and cooperation and what it produces, what our relationships actually produce. So as, and that's happening on 25th. And along with that, we see that Mars is in a trine to Chiron. Mars is in a trine to Chiron and in conjunction with Antares, right? The the uh, fire of God, Archangel Uriel, the heart of the scorpion. So Mars is going to be spitting fire, spitting fire um, right into the, our, <laughs> our eye, right? In terms of Chiron. And this for the Gemini is spitting fire about um, who you've been in your relationships, right? This is the sting of the scorpion and getting spitting the truth, spitting the truth through fire. And Mars ain't afraid. Um, and Mars is ready to go to battle because Mars is backed up by something that very meaningful um, and a sense of true understanding of what it's for. And so it, it's going to go, you know, there is the spit spitting of the fire now and the truth through fire. And what it's going to do is either burn away um, all of a lot of the shame and guilt that we've all been carrying with us. Um, but for Gemini, um, shame and guilt uh, about the society in general, it's either going to um, and, and the nature of society specifically, it's either going to allow for a really cathartic release, Gemini, of um, whatever responsibility you may still feel like you hold for um, society as a whole, or just the social setting that you really realize yourself in is the 11th house. And so it could not, it doesn't necessarily have to be society, but it could be, you know, your neighborhood or, um, you know, your social media networks or uh, your friend, your larger friend group and your social networks. Maybe there's something um, that you've been really hanging on to, Gemini, in terms of guilt, shame, maybe playing the victim, maybe playing the savior. Maybe the wounded healer narrative has been um, imposed so much that you don't even realize um, that you end up 
acting out different ways um, in the social context that are not really in line with who you want to be, who you could be, um, and are really just a way to bypass your own healing. So um, you're going to get some truth spit through fire with Mars in this trine, and it's either going to heal or it's um, and purify, or it's going to burn and it's going to trigger, and it's just going to get a deeper level of shame and guilt and um, just <coughs> deepening that that victim savior, uh, narrative in the social scene as a whole for you, Gemini. It's not good. I hope that, um, you know, many people may have already done a lot of work in this area. So whatever comes from this trine is like this last, like shooting of the, like I said, spitting the truth through fire. Um, it's, in, it's profoundly powerful, but it could go either way. It really depends on how, um, you are working with Chiron and it's direct now. So it's way, way more in our face. Um, these, these triggers of trauma and the inner child are, are so much more on the surface now and we can't really get away from it. Much like, <laughs> much like all these squares in the chart. So that's just, that's just the weekend. So if we move to the, if we move forward to the th third quarter moon. It's going to be in, it's going to be in Libra. It's going to, um, be squaring the sun in, in your eighth house as well, right? The sun. And this is, again, this is going to be this area for you, Gemini in the shadow. And you're going to really, um, find, I would say, find a lot of sus like sustainment and illumination and your focus specifically, I feel like is going to be on tying up loose ends, making sure that everything is, um, taken care of and fulfilled in this realm. What are your, in terms of what you're producing in your relationships and in your, um, in your relationships and in your, um, man, I've been recording for so long. Like it's starting to just all run together. I'm so sorry. Um, your relationships and then what you're producing in them. Right. And, and you want to, this, this focus with the moon and Capricorn is specifically how you, um, make sure that everything is attended to and you finish what you've started in that realm of, uh, you know, participation and production and distribution, right? Um, investments you've made. You want to make sure that you follow through with all of it before you move into the next cycle. The square to the moon in Libra at this moment um, is going to be a little bit of a tug down into um, you really starting to visualize where, um, what you want to materialize, having a very clear vision in your mind's eye of what you want to materialize when it comes to fun and joy and, and creative artistic expression, those fifth house energies, um, and what that means for you, Gemini, and it'll be a sensitivity. You'll feel it and you'll feel like, well, if I want to, I want to start, I want to start visualizing because I know I need to do that in order to materialize something that I want. And so you're going to start feeling into that, but how do you simultaneously feel into that, but act out in a way that's, um, committed to finishing what you started and following through this process in this realm. So this might be a business thing for Gemini or certainly, um, the fulfillment of a, some sort of contract and making sure that even if it's not, um, about fulfilling a contract that it has to do with your commitment to seeing your process all the way through before you step across the threshold. You don't want to leave anything, any stone unturned, any, anything unstacked. You want to make sure that you have looked around every dark corner, Gemini, and you will. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't feel into the, um, need to visualize, uh, what brings you joy. Um, in a new cycle, it's just going to be a little bit of discomfort when you have to live in those two places at once. One is your feeling and one is your expression. But I think this is important because I think it's important that we acknowledge, um, how these things don't necessarily always, uh, fit. And there's another, another grand cross grand square with Chiron, the moon in Libra, the sun in Capricorn and black moon Lilith in, um, 
in Cancer. Wow. There's a lot of these grand squares. That's pretty remarkable. And then if we go a week later um, to the actual new moon, what we're going to find, Gemini, is really you're going to really set some intentions around letting it burn. Let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. Specifically, Gemini, in your eighth house. And so you know that there's things that... Uh, you know, with Venus and Pluto that are really strong value-based things that um, you are really coming to evaluate and to feel into and be sensitive to in terms of meaning, especially in the eighth house, sharing and the warmth of sharing and what it means to you to be sharing. So there is a lot of letting go in this area, but this new moon in particular is really, um, is really inviting all of us to find a way to revere and honor and um, study fire and how fire is a symbol of transcendence over the cycle of death and rebirth, which is a very much a big part of the eighth house in general as well. So let it burn and not only let it burn, but learn to love that it's burning because we know that we can't emerge from the flame as a phoenix until the burn is happening. And so there is um, something that we can honor and that we can uh, intend to grow within ourselves, which is the reverence and the willingness to transcend this cycle through um, our meditation and focus on fire as a symbol of it. So let it burn in this eighth house, Gemini. Um, just let it let it burn away and um, know that over the course of January, uh, as this lunar cycle unfolds, that there is a lot of release and purification that is about these areas for you, seventh house and eighth house, right? Your binding agreements and then what those agreements produce, either domestically, sexually, romantically, business-wise, any kind of binding agreement that um, we make, even at a global level, just by being a citizen on planet Earth that's in a body that is a binding contract. So let it burn, Gemini. Let it burn. Um, you know, you've been through some interesting times in the last uh, year and a half with the North Node moving through your first house. And, uh, you know, the best, I, I do believe the best is yet to come, but we have so, we have some pretty challenging um, times in the immediate future. And uh, Gemini, it seems to be right now, there's a lot of release and has been for a long time for you in this eighth house of um, that Capricorn uh, represents for you. So it's really in the darkness and the shadows and in the space of power that um, some of the biggest um, transformation is happening for Gemini. And it's just really being concentrated right now um, during this time. So Gemini, I'm going to leave it there for you. Thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. If you're interested in a personal reading, if you're interested in more information, getting on the email list, and if certainly if you're interested in supporting this work, which will um, allow me to continue to do it, you can get everything you need from the description box below and you certainly can stick around at the end of this video um, and get more information that way. So Gemini, have a great, great weekend. Um, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, whatever you celebrate. Um, just, uh, you know, I hope that it's joyful and that it's nourishing and peaceful for you. And uh, I'll see you. I'll see you on the next video, Gemini. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm.